In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated. Uh, in the world of competitive sports, there is an old saying. You play the way you practice. Because I have two coaches here today. You've heard that, I'm sure, before. That's a caution against being casual when you're practicing. It has mostly to do with how seriously you pay attention to what you're doing. When you're playing an actual game, it's the habits that you've ingrained in practice, so you do them reflectively, you don't have to think about them, that enable you to play your best, to get the most out of yourself, and thereby to grow, actually, and get a little better every time you play. And it also makes it more fun. Of course, this principle applies not just to sports, but to the rest of life as well. I'll give you an example from show business. In the early days of television, before the days of videotape, everything was broadcast live. And I know of an actor who was on the soap opera back then, and when he was in a scene that involved a telephone call, when he was rehearsing it, he would pantomime the receiver with his hand and not bother with the actual prop phone. The problem was that when it came to performance, there were times when he would suddenly catch himself <laughs> live and in front of a national audience, <laughs> speaking into his hand. Play the way you practice. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, or the first Sunday of a new season, in a new church year, and during each season in the church calendar, we give our attention to a particular area of the life of the Spirit. In our spiritual practice, we look in a particular direction, and if we do it right, we focus on what it means in our real lives. But of course, when each of those seasons is done, it's not as though that particular direction we've been looking in just goes away. <coughs> we're done with it. What we concentrate on in each season is present with us throughout the year. They're all there, in some measure, all the time. The season of the Spirit that governs us all, for us Christians, is one season that governs us all. What's that? What season governs us all? The most important one. Easter, absolutely. This, that season of the Spirit calls us all the time to be a resurrected people, resurrected from the power of sin and death. And in terms of our real lives, that means we are called to live every day in joy and freedom. That's the resurrection that enables us to do that. That's what our church calls us to practice in the season of Easter, and the better we practice it then, the better we play it the rest of the year. So as of today, we're an advent. To what do we give our attention in this season, this year, this year? The word Advent, as we know, means onset, approach, something that's on the way, getting here. And of course, here in church, it refers to the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, there are three ways in which we should understand this, two of which we're familiar with, one a little less so. Of course, the most widely observed way that we understand the coming of Christ is the coming of Jesus, the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. 2,000 years ago, our beholding of the Incarnation in that event. In Advent, we approach the reality, we let it dawn on us over these four weeks, that God took on a human life. That's a, a mind-boggling suggestion, of course, and, and it remains so, despite the fact that we've lived with it all these centuries, we know it as Christians, and so we tend to take it for granted. God was born, lived like we do, died as proof that God loves us infinitely, and then was resurrected to show that God's love for us is more powerful than death. When we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, we re reclaim all of that. And that's what's coming towards us now. That's what we prepare ourselves for. That's the usual way that we experience Advent, and the way that we prefer, because the second way that we commonly talk about the coming of Christ, uh, when we talk in church, especially on this first Sunday of Advent, we talk about the second coming, as we heard in today's reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the coming of the Son of Man, at the end of the age, the day of judgment, as some people call it, when everything's finally going to get resolved. Everything that goes wrong will be put right in us as well, and God's justice will be established once and for all. We have these passages in the New Testament in which Jesus prepares his disciples for this time. We don't like to hear these texts. They're not comfortable texts. 
Today, uh, Jesus compared that time to the flood, when nobody knew what was going to hit them. We hear that it's not going to be a pleasant experience. But for another, on a completely different level, we don't like to hear them because it, we just don't believe it. It sounds like superstition. The product of a bygone era. We are thankfully past all that, we think. And not only do we dismiss the whole idea, it leaves us with a little question about Jesus' credibility nodding in the back of our head. What about all the rest of what he says? If he's subject to this kind of stuff. But I want to suggest that this language that we hear every year about the flood, about signs and portents, earthquakes, and famines, the beginning of the birth pains, represents something very real and has very much to do with our real lives. We all, all of us here now, every human who's ever been alive and ever will be alive, we're all part of an infinitely bigger picture. It's the ground of everything in this world. It's the basis of the life that we live here, this bigger picture. When we say that God created us in God's image, that's what we're saying. We're part of the life of God that way. What we do matters to God. What we do creates ripples in that bigger picture, for better or worse. And all that language about famines and earthquakes and people getting snatched up and taken away, those are all images of that truth. The fact that we live in that bigger picture. If we believe that Jesus is speaking the truth when he tells us that the kingdom of God is among us, if we believe Jesus when he says that, we're talking about this big picture that we all live in every day. Which brings us to the third understanding of the coming of Christ, the one that we usually don't have in mind, and that's this. What we have Christ coming into the world 2,000 years ago, we have Christ coming at the end of human history to bring justice. Finally, we have the advent of Christ right now. Every day, Christ who is asking to come into our lives all the time. This is where the rubber meets the road, because it's what grows out of the birth of Jesus and what makes the ripples in the bigger picture. And I'll give you an example of how this happens. Most of you probably know uh, of the Easley family turkey extravaganza that we have upstairs. Anybody not know about that? No. Okay, then you know. It happens in memory of their son. It started in their kitchen a dozen years ago with five turkeys and four people. It has grown every year. Now it happens at St. John's. Yesterday, about 75 people delivered 150 turkey dinners with all the trimmings to people who wouldn't otherwise have had them. That's Christ coming into people's lives. They're not members of this church, but that doesn't make any difference. And I'm talking more about the volunteers than about the people eating the food. I took my older son with me uh, last year to deliver two turkeys, and on our way home he said, this is part of our Thanksgiving now from, from now on. It lands in you and it grows. That's the way Christ comes into your life. He might not, my son might not name it that way, but that's what it is. And hopefully someday he will come to understand it. Maybe he does not. We prepare in Advent for the Christ who is always approaching us, always ready to enter our lives, always about to show up. You could look at everything we do in church from that point of view. We are practicing here to let Christ come into our lives. We are practicing to open that door, to unblock the way for the living power of God to come into our lives, for the Holy Spirit to get to work. We practice it here so we can play it out there. God grant that we practice well and that we play the way we practice. Thanks be to God.